Right, we're, we're going to uh, start worship. Um, I have a, I was reading in uh, First Peter. How, how about, can we stand? We're going to uh, read from the Bible in First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3. I was reading this this morning. This is uh, awesome. Uh, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him, uh, see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I was reading that this morning, and I was just just remembering um, that we have such an awesome thing to look forward to, um, our our life with God, with each other in heaven. Let's sing uh, Only King Forever.
Hey, good morning, Wabash Church. Welcome to worship this morning. So glad to see you. And those of you that are watching at home, so glad to see you. And we would really love to see you here. When you think that time is right, we are ready for you to come back and join us. Somewhere in your pew, there is a card that looks a little something like this. And if you are a guest with us this morning, we'd love for you to fill this out. Drop it uh, in uh, the offering box, which is just out in the lobby, or hand it to one of the staff. Or better yet, if you're a guest and a first-time visitor, head to the little kiosk, which is just outside. And we've got a gift for you that we'd like to give to you uh, and welcome you in that way. So so take time to do that this morning. Hey, what a glorious weekend, huh? Weather-wise, wasn't this great? All right, so hands up. How many people worked in the yard? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you kind of you have to, right, when you have this kind of weather? So I was working in the yard yesterday from about 9 in the morning until about 7 at night. And yeah, I know. <laughs> Pity me. And here's what I was thinking, though. This is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Because you remember the old adage, because by the time you're done, you have to go back. And so as I'm, as I'm weeding in the yard and I'm making my way around the bend, I'm looking back and I swear I saw weeds pop up. <laughs> While I was on the other side of the yard, I thought, I, I heard this snickering laugh from the dandelions, like, yeah, try to, try to get me now. You know, and, and it was just, it seemed as though I was never going to make it. I'm just, I'm never going to be done with this. You might think that way about your faith. You might be thinking, you know, I, I'm just never going to, I'm never going to get there, wherever there is. I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to make it. It seems like, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge with my faith. I, I come back and I do the same things over and over and over again. I know I'm moving in the right direction, but should I be frustrated that I'm not getting there? Well, let me tell you this. We're going to talk about that. Funny you should mention that, because we're going to talk about that this morning. But the one thing I want you to take heart in is that even Paul, the Apostle Paul, said, not that I have obtained it. So if Paul's still working toward that goal, I think it's okay that we admit that we're still working toward that goal. And we'll say a lot more about that in just a moment when we get to the sermon. But until that time, welcome to worship. Let's continue to lift our voices as Aaron and the gang lead us in worship. So let's sing our praise to God.
to be praised. May the lips that we've been singing, the songs that we've been singing to you, and the hearts have been lifting up your name, may, may, may you just, <clears throat> may, it, may it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to watch the kids' video, so kids...
me sing it out jesus is alive empty cross the empty grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out jesus is alive for that isn't wasn't that yeah a fun almost sad reminder of what things used to be like that was from VBS two years ago we didn't get to have it last year but we are ready for a comeback this year so yay so VBS is going to be July 13th through the 19th from 9 to noon so that's just four days that's two months away um, so we need all the volunteers that we can get. VBS is one of those things that takes the whole church. You know, we have everything from registration, counting money, crew leaders, station leaders, registration, crafts, you know, all the things we need. So there's a place for you. So I hope that you'll be praying, praying about how you might be able to help us this year. So um, like Cameron said, it's great. I'm tired. That is a great... Um, that's a great sum of what VBS is. It's great, but you might be tired, but it's so worth it. So please be praying about how you can help. You can sign up online at our website, or you can see me, Abby, or Carrie at our children's counter. So thanks, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for all the opportunities you give us to be part of your work, Lord, and to build your kingdom. We just pray for VBS and for the planning, and we just pray that you're preparing hearts of volunteers and the hearts of children that are going to be coming. Um, we know that you've um, picked all those people out already, and I just um, pray that your will would be done in that. And I just pray for the kids today, um, as they hear your word, that you would just plant that in their hearts. And I just pray for the volunteers that will be teaching them and just speak through them. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the kids are dismissed. Thanks, Lindsay. <clears throat> so if you go out these doors and you make a left and you head over toward the nursery, uh, it is hard to miss. There is a big sign that looks like a big castle, and it says VBS. And here's the dead giveaway. There's one name for a volunteer on that list, and it's moi. So, uh, I mean, that would be pretty hilarious to have just me. Okay, now we're going to do games. Okay, great. Now let's do a Bible story. And then by Tuesday, you'll have a dead pastor. So, uh, that might be a positive for some of you. But, so, need you to sign up. So, uh, as Lindsay said, it's, it's really an all-church effort, uh, and it's a great opportunity uh, to serve the Lord together. Plus, there's uh, it's just great watching those kids smile and listening to them laugh and, and all of the noise that's around here during VBS week, um, a little bit of normalcy. So uh, we need you to sign up. Take some time and go uh, look at that list uh, this morning. Would you join me as we uh, have our opportunity now to pray together uh, and to lift our hearts and our concerns before the Lord? Let's go to him in prayer. God, you alone are our refuge and our strength. You are very present in all of our times, our times of joy and our times of sorrow, as the psalmist says. And so this morning, Father, we bring you the praise that is due your name, for you alone are worthy of our praise. Forgive us for the times when we heap praise upon ourselves, mistaking your goodness and your love for our abilities and our talents. And because we know we've come short of your mark for us and because of your great grace, we take a moment now this morning and confess before you. 
we join our voice with that of David in the 32nd Psalm when he writes, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. David said, and we would say with him, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And so in that spirit, Lord, would you hear us now in these few moments of silence as individually we confess before you. Father, your word assures us that we find forgiveness when we come to you and when we confess our sin. And so our intent this morning is to receive from your gracious hand the gift of forgiveness. So thank you, Father. We also would like to bring to you some that are in need of your tender care this morning. We have some that are still hospitalized with covid those that are recovering from it as well, and we would ask for their healing. We lift before you those that we know have undergone surgery in this past week, and we ask for their complete recovery. As some embark on further treatments, Lord, we ask that you'd give them strength. We lift before you the country of India and ask that those that are suffering would be touched by you, and those that we know are laboring there, we ask that you would bring healing to them and protection, and that you would especially strengthen those that are ministering not only to the physical but to the spiritual needs of the people there. And now, Lord, again, we have the opportunity to learn directly from your voice to us via your word. And so we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would cause there to be a desire within us to seek hard after you, even in our imperfection. And so we make our prayer to you this morning, asking these things of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if your walk of faith were analogous to a bike ride, how would you describe it presently? Are you pumping hard, fighting not only uphill terrain, but maybe a fierce headwind right now for some reason? Or maybe your life in Christ right now resembles more of a coast. You're just kind of cruising. Everything's cool, not having to pedal much, just kind of coasting along. Maybe you're on kind of a, a downward slope, which feels good now, but you know eventually you're going to have to pick up and start going uphill. But for now, you're enjoying that cruise downhill. Maybe you're a little fearful of an upcoming crash if you're not too careful. Or so, maybe you're on relatively flat ground, neither speeding down or struggling to get up. You're just kind of cruising straight ahead, spiritually speaking. Or maybe, because they're somewhat in vogue now, your walk of faith is more of an e-bike right now. You know, a, a, a hybrid, as it were. And so you pump a little, and then you level off and you coast. But then when you need help going up a hill, you just kind of kick it into gear, and you have just enough of that little assist to help you get up the hill. Now, as far as I know, a bike analogy for the walk of faith would be completely lost on the Apostle Paul. But running would not have been lost on Paul because, in fact, Paul often uses athletic endeavors to illustrate his points about faith. And the book of Philippians is one of those places where athletic analogies hang out for Paul. And that's where we are today at the end of chapter 3 
And so this morning, as we open up to chapter 3 of Philippians, whether it's looking to Paul's metaphors of running or our metaphor of biking, one point remains clear from both sets of metaphors, and it's this. The Christian life involves the pursuit of a goal. The Christian life, as you go through your life in Christ, it involves the pursuit of a goal. And while you might imagine Paul to have reached a sort of spiritual end goal, as it were, because, I mean, hasn't he kind of arrived, you think, by this particular point in his life? I mean, after all, he's Paul, right? You remember Paul, notoriety with the New Testament, as in Apostle Paul. However, interestingly enough, Paul, even at this stage of his life as he's writing Philippians, which is getting close to the end of his life, he still speaks of a goal and the end point up ahead to which he's aimed, and he says that he's not yet made it. Yes, even Paul is someone who is still in pursuit of of a goal. So what I hope you'll glean from this section of scripture this morning are wise words for the imperfect. That's imperfect people like you and like me. And guess who else also falls into that category by his own admission? It's the apostle Paul. Paul's going to give to us some wise words for the imperfect like us and like him. So let's take a moment and look at these words. Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. You might already be there. And when you get to chapter 3, go to verse 12. Philippians 3 at verse 12. We'll read through to the beginning of chapter 4, getting close to the end of the book of Philippians. Philippians 3.12, Paul writes this, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. First of, you'd like you, first of all, I'd like you to notice this. Paul begins this section by admitting one thing. He doesn't have it all together. In other words, right from the start, Paul admits to imperfection. 
In verse 12, he says, not that I've already obtained this. And then in verse 13, he says, I do not consider that I have made it my own. I've not obtained it. I've not acquired it. What is the it here that he's talking about? Well, you've got to go back to the previous section of Scripture to answer that. It's what we saw two weeks ago in Philippians 3. He was speaking there about gaining Christ. Remember, we spoke of of the two columns and, and how Paul uses the language of accounting. You have a column of credits and you have a column of debits. And he said he put everything of notoriety, everything that the world held as precious, he put that into the debit side, the rubbish side. Do you remember the graphic word he used? He said, that's a dung heap. That's where all those things go, what the world says I need. And he says, I've just got one thing over in the credit side. There's only one thing I'm searching after, knowing Jesus, becoming like him. This is the this that he has not obtained. This is the it that he has not yet made his own, Christ-likeness. Paul says, I'm not there yet. Paul, the apostle Paul, imperfection from the apostle Paul, I'm not there yet. John MacArthur writes that the race toward Christ-likeness begins with a sense of honesty and dissatisfaction, not being there yet. There's still more to know. There's still more to gain, Paul says. And so he adds these wise words for our imperfection. He says, I press on. I press on. The word here in Greek would describe a runner or, like our opening illustration, a biker who's pumping hard to the finish line, a runner who's straining for the tape. But built into the word's meaning here is a sense of eagerness. And so that makes me wonder, Does eagerness describe your pursuit of Christ-likeness? Are you eager to be like Him? Do you pump hard up the hill of Christ-likeness, eager to reach the pinnacle? I want to be so much like Jesus. I'm going to work hard for that. Or does the pursuit of being like Jesus simply feel like another burden? something to feel guilty over. See, there's nothing of passivity here when Paul says, I press on. And why is that? What is it that spurs on Paul's eagerness? It's the mere fact that Jesus reached for him first. He made the first move. It's about what Jesus did first in Paul's life. You remember the Damascus Road incident? Paul was not on horseback looking for or seeking out a Savior. He was on a seek-and-destroy mission looking for Christians so he could drag them out of their house and drag them to trial and hopefully to death. But what he didn't count on was that Jesus at the same time was looking for him. And Jesus won that contest. He reached him first. He laid hold of Paul for good forever. And so here Paul says, I press on to make it, meaning Christ-likeness, to make it my own because he made me his own. That's why I do it. This is Paul saying, I grasp eagerly to know him because he eagerly grasped to save me. That's why I go after him hard. 
such wise words from this imperfect one. So here's what I do, Paul says, because of that I forget and I press on. Paul sees them all as one action. He says, this is the one thing I do. I forget what lies behind and I strain forward. All part of one movement. So I think this means that we forget our past mistakes. Runners will tell you that you never look back to see your opponent. That's what I hear. It's not what I practice because I don't run. People die when they run sometimes, so I don't run. But that one little glimpse over your shoulder if you're a competitor could cost you valuable rhythm and thus seconds to your time, which could spell the difference between winning and losing the race if you look back. Don't look back. How many times has the memory of a past failure crippled you from stepping out in one area or another of your faith? Oh, that went horribly the last time I tried that. I am never going to attempt to share my faith again. I just got ridiculed. I'll never step out of my comfort zone. Paul says, don't look back there. One writer says, to be distracted by the past debilitates one's efforts in the present. But not only one's mistakes, but sometimes, sometimes our victories need to be forgotten as well. Because dwelling on them could lead us to a pridefulness that can be equally as crippling. We can lay crippled by our previous errors or by our persistent pride from past achievements. Both ways. And Paul knows that both can be besetting, so he says, I forget it all. And he implies good and bad. Forgetting everything that's behind me. I strain forward. And here again is a running illustration. Picture someone leaning into the tape at the finish line. That's exactly the word that Paul uses here. I press on toward the goal for the upward prize of the upward call. And you could substitute the phrase, which is for the word of. I press on toward the goal, which is the prize of the upward call. This is Paul saying winning is being called home to Jesus. That's the prize. Talk about joy, whatever comes. That's real resurrection power. The prize of the upward call. Do you ever think of your home going, whenever that is in God's sovereignty, do you ever see that as a prize to be awarded to you? I think we far too often, if we're honest, put the emphasis more on the here and now. Because we can be so tied to here, tied to our lives, tied to our toys, tied to the trappings of this world, that we miss the upward call and miss seeing it as the real prize. Which one are you living for? Here or there? And these are not only wise words, but Paul would also say this is the view of the mature. These are mature words. Verse 15, he says, let those who are mature think this way. I love what he adds after that. If you're thinking something different, don't worry, God will change you. Are you thinking about your pursuit of Christ-likeness in a mature way today? Because it's the spiritually mature that realize their own imperfections 
and their need to eagerly strain forward, not looking back at past failures or past accomplishments. It's the immature that look at life and go, hey, I got this. It's no problem. It's the mature that look at life and say, wow, do I need him again today. One author said, the mature run the race rather than imagine that it's over. So here's Paul, the wise the mature, the imperfect, saying, imitate me and those that are like me. Because, he says, there are others out there who are competing for your attention. You do well to imitate me because there are others who are after you, and they don't have the mature view, but rather, he says, they're enemies of the cross. But don't miss this little parenthetical phrase here. Paul says in verse 18 that he has warned them before about these folks, these false teachers. He says, and now I warn you again, but this time with tears. What I don't want you to miss is the intensity with which Paul is warning them about these false teachers. They're out there, Paul says, with great emotion. And it's a statement of just how deeply he cares about protecting the Philippians because later on he'll refer to them as his joy. This kind of emotion is not new to the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 20, you have the account of his bidding farewell to the Ephesian elders. And in chapter 20, verses 36 and 37, you read this, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, And there was much weeping on the part of all. And here in the Philippian church, Paul weeps over the errors that are tempting them. What about those that are close to you? Do you grieve for the falsehoods they're being exposed to? You know, we as a church should grieve for the worldliness that tempts us day in and day out. And Paul describes it in such verbs in the sentence, which makes it all the more intense. Here's how Paul sums up these enemies of the cross. He says, their end, destruction. Their God, their belly. Their glory, shame. Their minds, earthly. You see, everything about these false teachers in Philippi is the antithesis of verse 14. Remember verse 14 speaks of the upward call. These folks are tethered to the world, and there's nothing upward in them. And Paul weeps over them and over the worldliness that competes One author said, beware of any pleasure that impedes the passionate pursuit of Christ. Our citizenship, Paul says, our citizenship is not here amongst these trappings. It's in heaven. Rather than set up residence here, we need to pack up and start the move homeward. Strain eagerly for it. But that's tough, isn't it? Because we're creatures of comfort. We've become tied to here. We are tethered to our pleasures. There's too much we want to do here in order to allow your citizenship to be established elsewhere. What do you need to release so you can go? Are there certain pleasures that tie you to here? Destructive habits that have become commonplace? Maybe certain relationships. 
And note as Paul wraps this up what it is that is to occupy us in this place of residence. He says we're to await a Savior. And it's a word that combines patience with great expectation. You see, we know He's coming and we patiently wait for Him to make good on His Word. And what awaits us is not only His return, but our transformation, our real joy in whatever comes. And I don't know about you, but when Paul says here that we have this promise of a new body, man, it doesn't get much better than that for me anyway. Because he says we go from lowly to glorious. Why is that? He says, because of the power he has. A power that is able, Paul says, to subject all things to himself. Everything is so topsy-turvy, and what you turn on the news tonight is going to be different than what you turn on tomorrow. So, stop watching the news. Because all things, even COVID, are subject to him. First and foremost, not subject to chance. It's not subject to popular opinion. It's not subject to conventional wisdom or science. All things are subject to Him. And so it's Him that we hotly pursue. So He says, stand firm. Don't give into the attraction of this world. Don't get tied up in the here and now. Run for the tape and lean into it. Strain. Lay hold of the one who laid hold of you. And know this. He's got you. Let's pray together. Father, this is great news in the midst of our imperfection that we strain hard in our imperfection to reach that goal of the upward call. And Father, as we strain forward, we know that all things, all things in this life are subject to you. And so because of that, Lord, we strain hard. We lean forward to the tape realizing that the goal we have is to be like you, the goal of Christ-likeness. Lord, work that in our lives today. We thank you for your word, for the good news that's there, for the reminder that you and you alone are sovereign. So, Father, we seek more of you this day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's close our worship and song together. Let's sing this song in celebration.
was a blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory leading us in worship today. How do you guys feel about them? I'm also grateful for George bringing us the word. How do you feel about him? Yeah, that's good. And finally, I'm just thankful for God for all he's done for me. Are you grateful for what he's done for you today? Amen. Just a few things before we go. I want to talk to you about uh, crosses. Those of you who are good word workers, metal workers, we need crosses for our seniors. I just wanted to explain that at this bulletin insert. I'll tell you more about that. We also have some extra bottles out in the lobby. We're doing a fundraiser for CareNet. That's just a cause we believed in. We talked about that last week. I just wanted to let you know we have more bottles out there. Right now we have uh, Kids and Youth Hour over in the youth room. We'd love for you kids and teens to join us for that. We've also got a couple of great adult Sunday school classes. So stick around and enjoy fellowship together. Please allow me to say this blessing for you as we're dismissed. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>